A car in a parking garage bursts into flame. The fire crews extinguish the fire. They realize that there's a body in the car. A promising young man is dead, and no one knows how or why. If he's dead when the fire started, that's very suspicious. The thought of homicide was right from the beginning. Then, Dr. G investigates a bizarre tale of distress. It was strange just because I couldn't understand why it took four days for somebody to make it to the hospital. And a natural hospital death that may not have been so natural. My mom was being accused of murdering my dad. Altered lives, baffling medical mysteries, shocking revelations. These are the everyday cases of Dr. G, medical examiner. It's after midnight, and Robert Terrible is celebrating in a bar in Orlando, Florida. The last two days have been a peak experience for this newly minted electrical engineer on his first professional job. He was happy when he got his first job because there was a lot of traveling involved, and he wants to be going places. He's the son of Haitian immigrants who have watched his achievements with pride. When you go to college, A plus, go very good. In addition to being a good student, Robert is also a popular fraternity member. And when he travels, he never misses a chance to connect with his fraternity brothers. Robert liked to go out with his friend. What was special about him is that was the, the way he used to approach people, the caring sign. Tomorrow, he'll sober up and go home to his parents in New York. He called me on Thursday, and he talked to me, and he told me, fix my room, I'm coming Friday. But tonight, he's hanging with some local friends, cutting loose and drinking more than he usually does. At 3 a.m., Robert finally decides to call it a night. There's only one problem. He has to drive back to his hotel. Forty-five minutes later, a parking attendant spots a car with its engine running. In the passenger seat is a man apparently sleeping. The attendant, however, does not wake the occupant and returns to his office. A half hour later, he gets the shock of his life. Parking garage attendant starts hearing explosions, which I believe to probably be popping sound, which are tires uh, exploding or, gla or glass breaking. The man's car is engulfed in flames, and the horrified attendant can't even get near the vehicle. At that point, he called 911. 911 tells him to pull the fire alarm. Yes, uh, I'm calling from Central Garage. There is a car on fire, and somebody is in the car. Okay, hold up for the fire department, okay? The car is exploding right now. And I don't think the person is able to get out. Arriving on the scene, the Orlando Fire Department quickly puts out the fire. When the smoke clears, investigators get their first clear look at what is for them a most uncommon sight. Yeah, to have a fire death in a car is unusual. Less than 2% of all auto fires result in a death, and most of those occur as a result of crashes. The reason? When a car fire starts, an able-bodied person inside will usually get out before being burned. Because the driver did not get out in time, investigators immediately suspect that he was already dead when the fire started. It is not uncommon for the body of a homicide victim to be burned in order to help destroy evidence and thwart the investigation. Within an hour, a team of specialists arrive at the scene to investigate what could be a homicide. One is Dale Reynolds, an arson and bomb investigator with the Orlando Fire Department. I received a page from our dispatchers that we had a car fire in a parking garage with a fatality. 
We also asked for a homicide detective or someone from the violent crimes unit of the City of Orlando Police Department. And then also we, we asked for CSTs, crime scene technicians, because this is going to be a long, drawn-out case. And we started an investigation of the external of the car, of the parking garage, the area around it. They are going to we don't want to get around the body very much because we don't want to destroy any evidence that the medical examiner may find. Meanwhile, Chief Medical Examiner Jan Garavaglia, better known as Dr. G, hears about the case during her morning commute. I'm always listening to the radio, and I heard about it driving in that there was a car fire in one of the garages downtown, and I thought, oh, and that there was a dead body in one of the cars, and I thought, oh, boy. As soon as the medical investigator finishes documenting the site and removes the body, Investigator Reynolds begins his examination on the inside of the car. His primary objective, find out the exact cause of the fire. It is a tedious process. We took samples of the carpet in the driver's seat area. We took samples from the carpet behind the driver's seat, samples from the back seat, passenger side. And we took samples from the seat where the occupant was actually sitting. A lot of thoughts are going through your head of all the possibilities. And uh, when I get to work, he was waiting for me. At the start of most cases, Dr. G carefully reviews her medical investigator's field report. So what I have information is that there is a security guard, and he found a fellow who he thought was sleeping in the passenger side of the car. And about 30 minutes later, he notices a car fire. My understanding is there was an explosion. And sure enough, his car was on fire. It was consumed in flames. And there he is, uh, very badly charred inside his car. The scenario is rife with complex questions. What or who caused the fire? And how could a young man burn to death in a parked car unless he was murdered? At this point, we didn't know a lot. We didn't know who he was. So a lot of possibilities uh, are going through your head. Although we have the security guard stating that he saw him a half hour before, I mean, I don't necessarily believe them. And how does he know he's sleeping? How did he know he wasn't just dead in the car? Or did this guy maybe kill him? Uh, is he trying to cover something up? Did he really even go on his round? Could be a million and one scenarios. I don't believe anybody. While the list of unanswered questions is daunting, Dr. G is confident of one thing, at least for now. The thought of homicide was right from the beginning. Next, Dr. G makes a discovery with ominous implications. Even if nobody did anything to him, but he's asleep in the car and somebody else starts the fire, that's a homicide. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. The charred remains of an unidentified fire victim are taken by lab techs to be x-rayed. One of the first things I'm going to do is doing full body x-rays. Head to toe, we will x-ray that body. Only hours earlier, the body was found in an Orlando parking garage in a car engulfed in flames. Because of the fire's mysterious circumstances, foul play is strongly suspected. Why is he there? Uh, what caused him not to get out of the fire? Now it's up to Dr. G to find answers to these and other complex questions. One of the first priorities in a case involving a fire victim is to determine the victim's physical condition at the moment the fire began. to make a determination, was he alive or dead? If he's dead when the fire started, that's very suspicious. He might have been placed there and then the fire started to cover up evidence. Because it is nearly impossible to detect any injuries on charred remains externally, Dr. G must rely on x-rays to show her what she cannot see. 
have a man that is charred beyond recognition, charred from the head to the toe. The external exam is more difficult because with all that charring, uh, with the skin being gone, and I could easily miss a gunshot wound. Dr. G examines the developed film, and even before making a single incision, she can already draw one tentative conclusion. On the x-rays, at least, there appears to be no sign of any trauma that could have led to the victim's death before the fire. The only injuries Dr. G can see on the film are those sustained during the blaze. When she examines the actual corpse, she is faced with one of forensic pathology's most daunting challenges, autopsying burn victims. I have no idea who he is. I'm trying to figure out even if he's white, black. It's very difficult when you're black charred head to toe. When I mean charred, I mean it's black. His skin in most areas have burnt off, and the underlying muscle is blackened from the burning, just like a charcoal bouquet black. During the external exam, one of Dr. G's first tasks is to analyze the body's unique burn pattern. Burn patterns can confirm whether or not the victim was motionless while the fire burned. The posterior back and buttocks and backs of the legs are not charred as much, not burnt as much, because they're up against the seat and there's less oxygen getting to that. The lack of burning in these areas proves that the victim never moved after the car ignited, another possible indication that he may have been dead before the fire started. So that was all consistent with him sitting in that seat uh, when the fire was going on. In burn cases, there are specific parts of the body that can reveal even stronger indicators of when a person died, the nose and mouth. What we're going to look for is, was he breathing? Was he breathing the products of combustion? It would be carbon monoxide that he's breathing, he'd be breathing hot gases, and he'd be breathing a lot of sooty material. If she finds no soot, it's a sure sign that the victim was not alive. There's only one problem. There is soot. We find that sooty material inside his mouth, his nose. It's important, but not conclusive. The soot in the mouth and the nose could simply mean that the smoke from the intense contained fire drifted into the open cavities, rather than the victim breathing them in. The only way Dr. G can know for sure is to inspect the respiratory tract from the inside. She begins with the Y incision, and after opening the rib cage, finds that for the most part, the victim's internal organs were not affected by the heat. Once we get past that layer of charring and even the deeper muscles, it's gonna look fine. Dr. G takes fluid samples from the victim for toxicology tests, and then begins her search inside the body's cavity. Because the death is a suspected homicide, she looks carefully, once again, for any signs of foul play or trauma which may not have been perceivable on the x-rays, such as internal bleeding, or perhaps even strangulation. I'll remove some of the chard to see if there's evidence of strangulation by hemorrhages in those muscles. But here, too, she finds nothing out of the ordinary and no sign of injuries indicating that the victim may have been restrained. No evidence of strangulation, no blood in the pleural cavities, no evidence of any type of trauma to the chest or abdomen. But then she opens the respiratory tract. Within seconds, she uncovers something that contradicts almost every previous assumption in the case. There is soot in the victim's trachea and lungs. There's soot all the way down. There was soot all the way into the main stem bronchi, going into each right and left lung. And when you cut the lungs, there's soot even in the tissue of the lung itself. That soot has gone all the way down into his lung tissue. This finding is undeniable. The victim was alive during the fire. Without a doubt, he's breathing that sooty material in there. Once I saw all that sooty material that he inhaled down his trachea into his lungs, I know he's alive when that fire occurred. 
coming up next. The victim is identified and his family learns of his horrendous death. They were kind of lost. They came here from New York. Nobody was telling them anything. It's just heart-wrenching what they're having to go through. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. Dr. G has completed the autopsy of an unidentified young man found dead in a car fire. Her original hypothesis, that he was dead before flames engulfed his car, has been shattered by the discovery of soot deep inside the victim's lungs, clear proof that he was alive after the fire started. Without a doubt, he's breathing that sooty material in there. With this finding, she can now determine the cause of death. He died from inhalation injuries due to a conflagration, meaning a huge fire. And an explosion was heard, and that was consistent with everything uh, that I found. In other words, the vapor and smoke from the fire itself caused the victim's respiratory system to fail. What she still doesn't know is the manner of death. Was it a homicide or something else? Well, why is he there in the passenger seat? How did this fire get started? What's he doing there? And why didn't he get out? A lot of that wasn't answered by just doing the autopsy. Right after the autopsy, I listed the things that I do know, all my facts, and then just say, well, we're gonna pen this. We're gonna have to pen it for the arson investigation. We're gonna have to pen it for the toxicology. But while Dr. G awaits these results, the homicide detectives uncover another lead. A cell phone is salvaged from the wreckage and police manage to identify the victim through phone records. They immediately contact his family. The victim's name is Robert Paul Terrible. I get a phone call around 4 o'clock. Do you know Robert Paul? And because we found a body, we found a cell, a cell phone. And right then there, I just knew it was him. The mother and the aunt came, and uh, I felt so bad for them. They were kind of lost. They came here from New York. Nobody was telling them anything. It's just heart-wrenching what they're having to go through. But you know what? The main thing is they just want the truth. They just want to know that somebody cares and is going to try to get the answers for them. And I think after talking to me, they felt confident that I was, was going to give them the answers the best I could. Dr. G then learns from the family that the night of his death, Robert had been out at a party with some of his college fraternity brothers who live in the Orlando area. It's not much, but at least now, Dr. G knows who the victim is and some of the circumstances leading up to his death. It takes several more months for the preliminary results of the arson investigation to arrive. Our job is to find the origin and the cause of the fire. And I would say in 80% of our cases, we know what caused them. The point of origin was somewhere in the driver's seat, at seat level, area of the dash, but we, did, we, couldn't, we couldn't come up with a definitive cause. But they are fairly certain that the fire was not set by any person, including Robert. We could not find any evidence that would support an arson finding. They're pretty emphatic that an accelerant wasn't used. I don't believe it was a fire that was started by anyone. We cut samples. They were all tested for ignitable liquids, none found. So that's key. I mean, that's to me, rules out uh, homicide uh, for me. But it leaves the arson investigation with only theories. There are many things. Uh, the car could have shorted out. Without the ability to prove a theory, we don't like to say. Although Dr. G may never know how the fire began, she hopes that the toxicology results will help shed light on the other remaining mystery. Why Robert didn't get out of the car once it started burning. 
We didn't have trauma, but maybe we've got something chemically that's causing him not to leave. Something such as a drug overdose, but it's an implication that Robert Terrible's family denies emphatically. Their son does not use drugs. I'm looking for drugs of abuse. I didn't expect any after talking to his family. He's a really nice kid, but sometimes the family doesn't know. And so, you know, you, you always sometimes get a little surprise. However, in this case, toxicology tests prove that Robert's family is right. He did not use any illicit substances on the night of his death. But he did, apparently, drink quite a bit. His toxicology showed him to be very intoxicated, slightly over a 0.2 milligrams per deciliter of uh, ethanol in his blood. And driving while intoxicated, just to give you a, a rough idea, is 0.08. So very highly intoxicated. With the toxicology report in hand, Dr. Jean now believes she can explain why Robert Terrible did not get out of the burning car. He was too intoxicated to escape the fire. It is the key that enables Dr. G to explain the tragic circumstances that led to Robert Terrible's death. After a long day of business meetings, Robert goes out for drinks with college fraternity friends. It was kind of unusual that he was out doing that. He's very alcohol kind of naive in that he doesn't drink much alcohol. By the time he leaves the bar, Robert's blood alcohol level is very high, over twice the legal limit. At the garage, he gets in the car, starts the ignition, and turns the air on to keep him cool on a hot Orlando evening. But he quickly realizes he's too drunk to drive. He then does what many would consider prudent. He puts the car into park and decides to sleep it off. He's probably too tall to sleep behind the steering wheel. We theorize that he got out of the car, walked around to the passenger seat, you know, kind of scooched down in the seat and got where he was comfortable so he could sleep. Within the half hour, a fire breaks out somewhere under the dash. It's not a smoldering fire, it's a fairly fast fire. The fire quickly engulfs the passenger side where Robert is sleeping. Because he has excessive alcohol in his system and he is not usually a heavy drinker, Robert remains unconscious. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant, so that would delay him being aroused from a fire. The fire consumes the vehicle, and Robert along with it. The car's tires explode, which alerts the garage attendant who calls 911. But for Robert, it is too late. The searing vapors he breathes in burn his trachea and fill his lungs with black and soot, which causes his respiratory system to fail before the fire is even extinguished. He had a lot of burning to his posterior pharynx or back of his throat, and then the complete charring. I felt he died from the inhalation injuries associated with thermal burns. To have a fire death in a car is unusual, um, especially this one where there is no violent act. He just died because he was sleeping in the car while it burned. Although questions remain, Dr. G is confident in her conclusion. Even though they feel they don't know the exact reason for the fire in that car, I feel that we have enough evidence, we have a preponderance of evidence saying that it's an accidental death, uh, it's an accidental fire, and that uh, it's just a tragedy. He was just a good kid sleeping it off and, and a tragedy occurred. But death, no matter what the circumstances, always leaves survivors with the same difficult questions. After graduate to spare something for him and he just go like that, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes when I'm thinking about it, I say, boy, I can't, I can't believe it, you know? I can't believe it. I don't ever expect it got to be him. Life can change completely in second. Coming up next, 
what appears to be a natural hospital death may turn out to be anything but natural. This roommate is making allegations that uh, the wife murdered him, that she strangled him. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. Fifty-eight-year-old Nick Blage is in critical condition, and for a week he's been fighting to stay alive, despite his failing kidneys. Before this illness struck, things had been looking up for the retired truck driver. He had just asked his ex-wife Joyce to marry him again, hoping to pick up where they left off 14 years earlier. She was his first love, and there wouldn't be any other but their wedding is not to be. On the seventh day in the intensive care unit, Nick finally loses his battle. The only one with him at the end, his ex-wife, Joyce. At least, that's what she believes. The hospital records his death as natural due to kidney disease. But Nick's roommate has a very different opinion. And the next morning, what he tells the nurse changes everything. This roommate is making allegations that uh, the wife murdered him, that she strangled him. I was stuck with very little information at that point, so I said, okay, you know, bring it in. I'm not going to just ignore it. Let's look into it. There's just one problem. Nick's body has already been sent to the funeral home, where it is set to be embalmed. They drain your blood out, they put preservative in you, they put cotton in your eyes, they wire your mouth shut, they stick a probe into your abdominal cavity, like blindly, and stick a bombing fluid in there. So there's a lot of trauma that occurs to the body that then makes my job harder. Just as the morticians are ready to begin, the phone rings. It is Investigator Kiroga of the medical examiner's office ordering them to halt any and all procedures on the body. It was a close call. He was set to be prepared, and that would have made things difficult. As the body of Nick Blage is transported to the Bear County morgue, Dr. G reviews the details of the accusation made by Nick's hospital roommate. According to Kiroga's report, the roommate was in a semi-sedated state that evening, behind a curtain. He had heard some kind of gasping, possibly <gasps> struggling to breathe. Gradually, the breathing became more ragged. The disturbing sound suddenly stopped. The roommate claims he then saw Joyce rush past his bed and into the hallway. She told the nurse, he's gone. He's gone, and then promptly uh, left the hospital. The nurse thought that was a little strange. According to the Department of Justice, almost 15% of all murders are committed by a member of the victim's family, a fact known all too well to Dr. G and her investigators. It sounded like it might have been incredible, so I took it seriously. The morning after my dad passed away, um, I got a phone call and it was the medical examiner telling me that uh, some accusations had been made, um, that my mom had was being accused of murdering my dad. The phone call provides Dr. G with a far different portrait of the re-engaged couple. I don't remember a lot of good times. I had noticed a lot of arguing between my mom and my dad. Um, a lot of just little mean looks. They eventually divorced, but Joyce never quite left the picture. My mom had remarried, and when she would get tired of this guy, she would move back and forth. And my dad always took her back. I honestly thought my dad was a fool. At first blush, the couple's stormy past could lend credence to the roommate's accusations. Did Nick Blaze die of natural causes, as the hospital believes? Or did his ex-wife give Mother Nature a little push? That's definitely something that needs to be looked into and investigated. We had a couple family members that actually questioned it. 
could this have happened? Coming up, the bizarre accident that started it all. I realize that it's natural disease may not quite be so natural. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. Before conducting her autopsy, Dr. G reviews the large volume of records she's received about Nick Blasia's one-week hospital stay. They had enough CAT scans and examinations that, that show that the problem was the renal failure, the acute renal failure. According to doctors, the 58-year-old died of advanced kidney disease in the hospital. But his hospital roommate says that Nick's ex-wife is responsible for his death. Now Dr. G has a murder investigation on her hands. He believed that the deceased ex-wife had smothered him with a pillow. Unlike the majority of autopsies, Dr. G will not be cutting Nick Blaze open to examine his organs. The medical records already give her a complete picture of his internal diseases. He had had such a good workup, I really didn't need to do uh, an internal exam to look for more trauma. Instead, she'll concentrate on the outside of the body in a search for signs of foul play. The first thing she spots is a huge wound on Nick's back. Now we've got a little bit of abrasion there. Nick has a serious two by three quarter inch bruise behind his left shoulder. Linear abrasions here, maybe from a, a fall. The mysterious wound is clearly not related to the alleged murder. But Dr. G wants to get to the bottom of it before continuing the exam. She returns to her investigator's report and discovers there's more to Nick's story. This deceased had actually suffered an accidental fall four days before he was admitted to the hospital. The fall happened in the apartment he shared with his ex-wife, Joyce. It is the day of his accident, and Nick's only health problem is a slight flu bug. Getting up from the couch, he feels faint and falls onto a coffee table, smashing his left shoulder. In terrible pain, he drags himself over to the couch to lie down. And there he will remain for four days, unable to get up and suffering from what he believes is simply a flu. Day in and day out, Nick's only sustenance are the ice cubes Joyce feeds him. And that's the extent of the medical attention he receives. Eventually, he begins drifting in and out of consciousness. It was strange just because I guess I couldn't understand why it took four days for somebody who was kind of incapacitated to make it to the hospital. The account of the accident gives Dr. G new insight into what likely triggered the kidney failure recorded in Nick's hospital record. His four-day ordeal on his couch caused him to develop a rare medical condition known as rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is, is a fancy word for the breakdown of your, of your muscles. When a person lies stationary for an extended period of time, their skeletal muscles can begin to physically deteriorate, especially muscles weakened by injury. As these muscles break down, the muscle cells often release proteins called myoglobin into the bloodstream, proteins toxic to the kidneys. The kidneys aren't functioning. They can't filter the toxic substances out of your body. You're building more and more fluid up in your body too. That fluid goes all sorts of places. It goes in, un, you know, into your skin and subcutaneous tissue. It goes into your lungs. You have difficulty breathing. In Nick's case, 
These toxins run unchecked through the body, ultimately resulting in multiple organ failure. I suspect he probably had some chronic alcohol problem, immobility, and just lying there, maybe some dehydration, all kind of combined to cause the rhabdomyolysis. The investigator's account, coupled with Dr. G's findings, provide a stunning revelation. I realize that his natural disease may not quite be so natural. Rhabdomyolysis, while potentially fatal, is preventable in the early stages. If Nick had gotten medical attention sooner, his condition could have been reversed. And according to Henry Quiroga's report, Joyce was there with them at home during his entire time on the couch. And he's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And that was important because, you know, why do you just leave somebody? If his ex-wife stood by while he suffered, it would lend weight to the roommate's murder accusation. Dr. G will have to collect more details about what Joyce did or did not do during Nick's four-day ordeal. But for now, she still must reach a forensic conclusion on the original question. Did Joyce murder her ex-husband in his hospital room? Coming up, the hunt for signs of murder and surprising new details about Nick's accident. I believe my dad would be very, was very vocal with the paramedics. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. Dr. G returns to the main reason for her autopsy, the hunt for physical evidence of strangulation or suffocation that would prove Nick Blage was murdered. The man spent four entire days and nights injured on his couch while his ex-wife stood by. And now this same woman has been accused of finishing him off in the hospital. Dr. G prepares to inspect the one area that will tell her if these accusations are true. So the things I was looking for was any kind of trauma on the neck, any type of injury to the neck. Nothing, just nothing. It's clear that Nick wasn't strangled with a cord or anyone's hands. Still, there's another readily accessible weapon in every hospital room, pillows. Pillows are often used in suffocations because their soft surface leaves no marks on the body. At least, that's what killers think. But for the medical examiner, such a suffocation would indeed leave clues, literally right under the victim's nose. I will look to see if there's any pillow fibers. I'll look to see if there's any marks on the inside of his mouth. Yet after a thorough examination, Dr. G can find no traces of cloth fibers and no signs that any pressure has been applied to his mouth or nose. Nothing to indicate that he had any kind of foul play or pressure in his mouth, no marks on the outside or inside of the lips. There is no evidence that Nick was either strangled or suffocated. Dr. G is now certain. Nick's hospital roommate is wrong. Joyce did not murder her ex-husband. Most likely what the roommate heard was simply the last labored gasps of a dying man. I was very thankful that Dr. G could tell just from looking that nothing had been done like that. Dr. G's autopsy is finished, but one looming question remains unanswered. Why did Nick spend four days on his couch without getting medical attention? especially since his ex-wife was with him the whole time. The medical investigators soon uncover the last remaining piece of the puzzle, an emergency response report filed just one day after Nick's fall. It reveals that, in fact, Joyce did call 911 and that it was Nick himself who refused treatment. With this report and her findings, Dr. G is finally able to piece together Nick Blasia's last days. Paragraph, 
When Nick falls that day, he injures his back. It is not a fatal wound by any means, but it is enough to force him to lie motionless on the couch. Skin breaks down, and that were pressure sores, and that was from his prolonged immobility. Joyce, rather than acting neglectfully, begs him to go to the doctor and even calls 911. Paramedics arrive and attempt to take Nick into the emergency room, but he resists, insisting that he merely has a flu bug. Legally, emergency medical teams are not allowed to treat anyone who is unwilling to be helped. She told my dad, you know, you've got to go. You've got to have this looked at. You're hurt. With Nick's stubborn refusals, the paramedics can do nothing but leave. Nick continues to lie on his couch day in and day out. His muscles begin to atrophy. As they deteriorate, they release proteins into his bloodstream that are toxic to his kidneys, triggering the disease rhabdomyolysis. On the fourth day, Nick loses consciousness. And Joyce again calls paramedics. This time, the unconscious Nick is in no condition to object. He wouldn't go to the hospital until he was so out of it she could get EMS to take him. But they are too late. There is no way to medically remove the toxic proteins that have now spread throughout his bloodstream. System-wide organ failure is inevitable. Ultimately, they realized that there was not much else they could do for him. After seven days in the hospital, Nick's kidneys no longer filter toxins from his bloodstream. Fluid builds up in his lungs, making it hard to breathe. His heart begins to fail, and his final gasps are overheard by the roommate. The guy is in and out of consciousness. He's just heard some breathing. And oftentimes, what we call agonal breathing, or your last breath, maybe that's what he's hearing. A lot of these people are on medication, and they think they're hearing things and seeing things that aren't occurring. Nick's kidneys finally give out, and he dies of multiple organ failure. Dr. G had confirmed that it was the, the toxins that had shut everything down, that there had not been any foul play involved. In the end, Dr. G concludes that Nick's death was not homicide as suspected by the roommate, nor natural as deemed by the hospital, but accidental. The bottom line is the fall is what caused him to go into the rhabdomyolysis, which ultimately caused him to die. If I had known what the outcome would be, I would have kicked them into high gear to get them to a hospital. It's been very difficult coping with his passing. My father and I had been very close. So that was, it was just phenomenal, his loss.